This meeting of the Longmont Parks and Recreation Advisory Board will please come to order. Please call the roll. Ms. Sue Alberg is absent. Mr. Jeff Ellenbogen is absent. Mr. Manoj Gengwar, present. Ms. Paige Lewis, here. Mr. Dan Olson is absent. Mr. Rob Putnam, here. Ms. Katja Stokely, here. And Council Liaison, Mr. Aaron Rodriguez, is absent. Thank you. Um, any changes to the agenda? No. Okay, can I hear a motion to approve the agenda as it stands, unless anyone else has any? I move we approve the agenda. Second? Eight seconds. All in favor? Thank you. The motion passes. Approval of the previous month's minutes. Any comments or corrections? I did not see anything that needed to be corrected. Okay. So I'm going to move the accept the minutes. Okay, did you get a chance to? Second. All in favor of approving the minutes, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Second. Abstaining. Thank you. Public invited to be heard. Hi. Please state your name and address and uh, tell us what you're here to tell us. I'm not here to tell anything. I'm here to observe tonight, so. Great. Well, welcome. <laughs> Hi. My name is Dan Jones. I live at 825 Hillside Court, Walmart. Um, with St. Brent FC, we've been here a handful of meetings. We, I guess just we did, just had a tournament this past weekend with 170 teams um, that uh, was spread out amongst a handful of facilities, Sandstone being one, um, Pleasant View and Boulder being one, East Boulder Rec Center being another, Twin Peaks Charter Academy being another, and uh, a late addition because a big chunk of sandstone was not playable, which came, obviously there was a lot of snow, which came to us on a Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday time frame. We were kind of up in the air. Um, so we had to move what worked out to be like 50 or 60 games to Tom Watson Park, which if you're a local business, that takes away a lot of people traveling through Longmont. Now they're just traveling through Boulder, Iowa, gun barrel. So, just it's a great event, though. Beautiful weather. Thank you. Old business. Do we have any old business? No. Okay. New business. Use of public places process. Hello, Ben. Hi. <coughs> My name is Ben Wagner. Um, I'm with recreation. And I also act as ombudsman for the city in the UOPP process, and I'm going to go over what this is about, um, just so you guys know kind of what we do, uh, recreation's role within that system, a little bit about my role within that system. So, um, I'll get started. Come on. I know it. And if I screw up, give me a break because I get super nervous and new groups for me. If I've been around a while, I'm really comfortable with it. So, what is use of public places permit, UOPP, uh, trying to use a public place for purpose of conducting a special event, organizing block party, sell or serve alcohol, you must obtain a use of public places special event permit from the city clerk's office. Do many so, people... Go ahead. Use the parks for weddings. And yes. Where, which park? Which park? Um, the the most popular park for weddings is uh, both Roosevelt and Dawson are two oh. most most they popular parks. They don't use parks. the mansion. Where the this one is about use of public places is always specifically about outdoor oh. areas. So that's a great question because there that is specific to outdoor this whole thing. Um, so some examples of what we have: Rhythm on the River. Uh, that's city event, left hand run by left hand. Uh, Longmont Symphony is kind of a, a group effort between the city and the symphony. Um, the downtown concert, so LDBA. Um, our parades and races, that's a lot of us. In recreation, Cinco de Mayo, and then some <coughs> private events. 
Um, weddings, uh, Roosevelt Sandstone has become a more um, a popular spot for weddings. We've been getting more out there over the last couple of years. It, pretty small, but it's really a neat location. A lot of family and company picnics, a lot of uh, that will come into this. It will be uh, graduation parties, for example, when they do alcohol. It's so alcohol a, is, the, is the determining? That's kind of the determiner in those private uh, events and class or family reunions. And so these are the things that kind of, is it required? And this, there are some gray areas and that's, that's some, sometimes where I come in is to try to help private citizens to, or organizations to understand how to maneuver, do they really need one? Uh, Rochelle Hinman also with recreation, really, this is, this is really what she does. And then I'll jump in and help her where, the, where it's needed. Do we have road closures? Are they selling something? Serving or selling alcohol? Charging? Amplified sound. There's a good, good one. So, for example, a radio set on a table, it's technically amplified sound, but we kind of look at it as something that is put forth to an area. Not, not ambient music, not background music, but something that is specifically amplified for the event. Just try to use common sense, for example. Is there a, do you collect sales tax when there's admissions or, or anything like that? I mean, is there, is having these events, is it able to raise money for it? Well, there, there are fees involved, so there are city fees involved, but sales tax, only on things no, that are sold. Yeah, right? if they, only on things that are sold. Yeah. Oh, not admission charge, no. Because no. I pay, Admission is, admissions. admission is pretty pretty rare for an, an admission charge. Or you don't we don't see that very often. Really. So. Okay. City so doesn't see. care about the private party if they're charging or not. Okay. Um so we'll pick up a left hand mm -hmm. that was the, Yeah, left hand left hand. That's yeah, so yeah, yeah, so yeah that, would we get a cut of that or no, all? No, that's okay. they go through the fee. Yeah, that's that's a good point. So that would be one. A left-hand event would be an example of a four-fee event. And we don't have anything to do with that. They pay for use of public places and the use of the park itself, which we'll get into a little bit. So how do you get started? Oh, here you go. You're talking about the number. Block parties, 20s, night last year. Um, use of public places with alcohol. 40 of those, out, just alcohol in public places, just a few of those. And then 80. So combined, she didn't do it combined, but right about what, 160 events that are that are like this. So there's a lot of them. Um, a ton of them we don't. They just kind of go through the process um, that we don't see. Family parties. I don't. We don't need to see that as a group. They get started. They call recreation, or they can call the city clerk's office, and we'll get them to the right person. I think one of the things to point out too is. If it's a park shelter with no alcohol, recreation schedules all of those. And there's about 1,500 of those every year that don't go through this process unless they want to have alcohol or the amplified sound. So every weekend, from, wow. yeah. Yeah, every weekend from you know the middle of April when the bathrooms open until they close in November, with particular wow. emphasis on the summer weeks, it's dozens of shelters rented every single weekend. So, and that's a process that we take care of again outside of this process. Okay, where can we where can I have my event? This is where we try to help. We got you know we've got Lamont's got great facilities, lots of nature areas, 45 parks. Um, we try to figure out there are parks that are appropriate for some things, some parks are not as appropriate. Trying to fit the square peg into a Eh, hexagon. Um, road closure, obviously a huge deal with where your event is. Um, we we help determine. They usually will start with Rochelle in our office, and she she knows she's been doing this for a while, so she knows what type of event will fit in particular venues, and then try to help them pick one that's going to be most successful for them. And that's sometimes where I'll get involved with them as far as trying some additional help from. Them. From me. One of the one of the things that we've done in Roosevelt Park 
is we have implemented uh, quiet weekends. There were so many things happening in the park that the, the neighbors were being impacted every single weekend. So if we have two events back to back, two weekends, the third weekend is what we call a quiet weekend and, and we don't schedule anything in the park that weekend. Don't schedule anything at all versus mm -hmm. scheduling quiet thing. No, no, nothing at all, generally. Yeah, it's yeah. you know, I feel like shelter might be ready. Yeah, yeah, sure, quiet yeah, things can easily become loud things. Yeah, yeah. But a, a shelter rental at Roosevelt, like the stone shelter, which we've been working on, that would be something we would rent. But you know, that's usually a kids' party, that right. sort of thing. Okay. So. Okay. Um, the process with recreation services. When they call us, what type of event is it? What type of what type of thing are they doing? Are they selling things? Are they doing alcohol? What are the numbers involved? Work on the location, kind of went through that a little bit. Parking space is a huge issue. Is it a race? Is it a concert? You've got to have enough parking. Neighborhood, Jeff hit on that a little bit. We try to think about that with every event, even some weddings that we've had at Dawson, for sure, some big ones out there that the neighbors are close. Neighbors are close. So that, that can be a big deal. Um, and are the amenities appropriate? Uh, is there enough? Do they have the shelters that they need? Do they have playground, open space? Um, and then we go through, we'll collect the fee for and issue the facility permit, which goes into the process as recreation's part of here's, a, here's us saying yes to this event. Ben, is yep. the fee a fixed amount or is it prorated depending on the size of the event? It depends on the size of the event. So so I think it's 100 and over. I don't have the, it, I, the exact I don't, yeah, numbers. But yes, yes. Sliding. Yeah. Um, and then when the customer goes through and does the UOPP, that's what they want to have is that facility permit. They put that in their UOPP application. And that shows that they've got the location ready to go. Okay, so some other factors that go in. Once we get into the UOPP process, uh, which is the, in the clerk's office, um, they've, it's a pretty extensive form. We're working on it, trying to get it so it can be online eventually where they can just I imagine TurboTax myself, where you, you, if you click something, you skip the next eight things. <laughs> we're not there yet, and so it tends to be a little bit of a long process, but um, we're working on it. So, you have need insurance, sanitation, both bathrooms and garbage, has to have a plan. Um, we do have guidelines for the amount of porta potties included in addition to the amount of toilets that might be within the park. Um, the environmental impact, um, Dave knows about that. <laughs> the park impact, uh, high risk activities. So are they doing a climbing wall or animals? Petting zoos, petting zoos, high risk activity. Uh, again, the neighborhood impact and back to parking again, another always a huge factor. So we've got to have your certificate of insurance uh, with City of Longmont, um, sanitation, uh, sanitation plan, uh, the, Im the impact, and that's parks. Parks kind of works on that. They they will take that piece and determine you know what's going on in the park. Do we have issues in it? Have we do we have a flooded park previously? We need to stay off an area, for example. There you go. Bounce houses, kayak pools. Fireworks, jousting, yeah, it happens. Not <laughs> traditional horse, but we do have the anachronistic groups. Society for Creative and Anachronism. Anachronism. There, thank you. Do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> I have a couple friends who are. Uh, if I was, I wouldn't help myself. <laughs> <laughs> so again, uh, neighborhood impact, and Jeff hit on that number of events, uh, Roosevelt's are. It, it could be every weekend at Roosevelt, we could do stuff. And then back, back to Park B again. And then we'll offer, that's not in English. Yeah, it's just <laughs> representing gibberish that, that everybody has to do. Uh, we probably could just put words in here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those are words. notice that. They are no, words? they're not. No. I don't think. Lord anyway, um, door hangers are something that, that we do around the, that we do and uh, events yeah. that happen that 
the areas surrounding, so they have to have a plan to notify the neighbors, and we require them to go through and put door hangers on, we give them a template for it. Um, we'll really help people to try to do that to make sure, that's one of the biggest things always, is to make sure the neighborhood knows what's going on. If they know, your problems go way down. And does the door hanger uh, include contact information? Yeah. You know, if you have on site contact. On site. Oh, good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. which yeah. is great. I've yeah. lived a couple of houses spot? away from Roosevelt for, well, on and off since 2003. Mm -hmm. And they do a great job. It used to be, you just, you wouldn't know about it, but these guys have done a great job. You get flyers three or four days beforehand and uh, tells you all the information you need to know. So it's working well at Roosevelt anyway. Thanks, Steve. Well, one of the, one of the <laughs> questions I was gonna ask at some point, but I'll ask it here, is if you have an issue with something that's going on uh, in a park or whatever, but you're not a neighbor and you don't have a door hanger or a flyer, how do you know who to contact? Well, that would be, um, you can call, always call the police. So not emergency mm -hmm. dispatch. Yeah. And, and that's, that's the, they're the right it's people. Yeah. So they'll, the, you're gonna tell them what's going on or what your concern is and they have to go the police. But the police can often contact recreation if somebody's around. I mean, they, they, have, they have options too. They have their own call list for us. So if it's something that really needs to happen, I'm on that call list, Jeff's on that call list, where they can get, they can always get a hold of one of us. Police can, and we can maybe help with that if we, if we need to on our emergency basis. Well, because I know that, you know, some of you know that, like, I've been to events at Prospect or whatever, and I've found all the uh, curb cuts blocked and the handicap parking and stuff, and then I don't know who to go tell that. Mm -hmm. that. I would call the clerk's office in that, in okay. that sense. All right. Thank you. And since then, in Prospect, they, they don't do those large events anymore, based on just the amount of people they ended up getting, it was overwhelming, so. Yeah. Who's in charge of monitoring these, these programs and stuff? And who's in charge of, like, is there a park police, let me say, or is Community it the police well, department? On. I mean, who kind of has some control, can have some control over it? Well, the reason that we do this process is so that when they do the event, they have the event organizer, and that person is responsible on site for the event that day. We have their contact information, we can contact them. That is the responsible person. Our process with a problem is through emergency services, or certainly recreation if we're, you know, if we're around, or we can be gotten hold of at any time. So we don't put, at a private event, like, like a left-hand event, other than Jeff may go out to listen to music, or and you know some of our people, some of our people always do. We don't staff them; they don't have a staff person on that. Obviously, our events it's full of our staff, so we're not do, as worried about that. Do you think it's that. necessary to have staff, or is it working out okay? It's my belief that the system has been working pretty darn well. Usually, these bigger events are people that have been with us for a while; they know what they're doing. Left hand's a great example. They they've got it pretty dialed down. You know, and, they, and they have to have so many police officers yeah. per hundreds or thousands of right. people that are there. So, so if they have they, alcohol. Yeah, anytime there's alcohol there, there right. has to be police there. Yeah. And, and the police department has started also requiring security um, officers in the sense that they're not there about the alcohol, they're there if something bad goes on in the event. and they found that being present ends the situation much quicker than if they have to be called in to yeah. the site. Yeah, and the, the system, the police have done a good job the last two years of kind of refining that um, to make sure there's enough security at any sort of event that might have a risk like that. So, so that would be that level. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Nobody noticed is only needed when the clock is closer to the neighborhood. Right? Yeah, sandstone. Yeah. And, you know, we wouldn't. We don't think there's two neighbors there, right? Yeah, yeah. So we wouldn't require. It, yeah. But at Willow Farm, we would require. Yeah. We, Willow Farm we've had issues with Thompson. Neighbors. You know, any any of the Roosevelt places like Park. that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay, so traffic control. This this is a really big part of a lot of events because it's a it's a triathlon, it's a bike race, it's a five k. Lots of those that happen both with us and with the, the public. Um, that's where we come together as a, a we have a traffic control meeting and meet with 
with that group about what their plan is. So at, at their own expense, they have to go to a professional company. Um, a lot of times around here, it's Level and Barricade, that's who we use, um, to put out traffic control devices um, and have plan to have event personnel, have volunteers, have police when traffic control is needed at a particular intersection. Um, so before a permit is approved, we have a meeting, um, and I'm in that meeting, um, which we'll talk about my role a little bit with that coming up here. So the alcohol AOPP, we we'll put in a little bit about this. So just this is kind of specific, specific uh, needs for just the AOPP is, is a little bit different. We try to so you don't have to go through the whole process just to have alcohol. And these are the, the uh, guidelines. It's, it doesn't actually come up a whole lot, just the AOPP. So, um, but the rule is if you're, if you're privately giving, so it's a, it's a nonprofit or something, you're, and you're, you're giving alcohol to your group, you have to keep it within 15 feet from the reserve portion, the shelter or reserve portion. And we need that outline of what that looks like. If you're selling alcohol, that goes into you have to have a license for that day. Um, you have to have a plan with a map. It has to be fenced. You have to have security so that people cannot go with alcohol out of that area. Rhythm on the river, that's what we do. We go through that process. Uh, we don't have to go to court if we've done it the year before, but we do give it to the court. They make it available for public comment um, during a a period of time before the event. If you went out to Rogers Grove in June, you'll see our poster out there that says when our, or probably May actually, you see our poster out there that says when our hearing <coughs> is, if you would like to comment, that sort of thing. So that's, that's that part. No glass bottle kegs uh, in city parks. So, will the request be approved? Um, several factors involved, the staffing needs, impact to the neighborhood, are they annual events, um, you have to have a completed permit and insurance. Once they've done the UOPP process, I, it's rare, I can't, Jeff, how many times can you think of? I, I, I can't remember, I, any. I, I don't think we, we've ever denied event, an event, so we try to give them enough information so that when they go through this process and they come out the other end, they're going to be successful. Often we'll have some tweaks at a traffic meeting, something pops up, we need to make them have them make adjustments, but we want them to be successful. That's, and that's my main role is to try to help groups be successful when they run into some roadblocks. This is everybody that can be involved. Um, it, it's everybody, can be involved in this. We got everybody all the way up to council if we had a particularly, something that was real big. I want to think like the concert we had out at Union. Yeah, Heaven Fest. Heaven Fest. Yeah. Um, anybody, any group in the city just about can, can be involved in the approval. How many? Um, no, it's been like 2006. No, it was when I was here. I know time's flying. Yeah. <laughs> I was here in No, it had to be earlier than that because Bessler was still here. Yeah. yeah. It was a wild seven, seven, eight, 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 30, 30, people out there by year. Yeah. So all of these groups can be, this is just to show that it, we have a system within the computer and everybody gets to take a look and the you know, people that are responsible for different areas are supposed to sign off on it. <coughs> Here's one of our permits. We give it to them. This actually is a volleyball permit. Um, we, that's it, that's the process. We give that out to them to get that done. So, near the end here, my role. I hold this unofficial position. I don't get paid for it. Thanks, Jim. You're welcome. Um, I'm Zbudsman for the City of Longmont, UOPP. This has evolved with the idea of helping applicants find ways to be successful with their events with city departments that they might need permission, interaction, and assistance from. So I think the way this, my position, current position to doing this evolved was sometimes, I'm on TV, I'll try to put it delicately, 
sometimes <laughs> individuals in the public can have difficulty with parts of the city at times dealing with them and dealing with some regulations and getting some things done so my role is to go in there and try to help to mesh that help them to get together bring them from here to here um, Jeff started doing that know, five years ago or so um, because we had some difficulties at some traffic meetings and um, I think it turned out to be a really good thing and I really enjoyed it myself so that kind of is what my role is it doesn't come up a whole lot and usually things really go smoothly but once in a while yeah. I think us in recreation we're used to dealing with the public a lot so that kind of is a natural fit for us okay do we have any more questions there are the guy in the orange shirt right oh yeah <laughs> orange. who's the orange shirt by the way who's the guy with the oh yeah, who's oh, that guy? yeah. <laughs> gotcha gotcha see both. that was at the beginning of the race when i was near jeff because i smoked him let me yeah tell you. yeah <laughs> <laughs> you're with your granddaughter you can keep her yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Rob, you had a question. Yeah. I would assume there are what fifty or sixty homeless people in town, or is it more than that? It's more than that. It's more than that. that. I would guess it's higher too. Huh? I would yeah. guess it's higher than that. It's, it's I believe it's higher than that. that. In any case, are they a problem with these for these events? Yes. Not generally. There are always specific things that can come up at an event, but in general, when you have large events, um, the people experiencing homeless that are chronic, that we, that we know of, for example, at the Memorial Building quite a bit, they don't want to be around large crowds. So when a large crowd like that happens, they tend to go elsewhere. Um, like I said, things can come up from time to time, but no, it's not a problem on any ongoing basis. Any other questions? Thank you, Ben. Thank you, everybody. Appreciate your time. Anything else from you, Joe? No, thank you. Oh, let me take, I'll take this. Okay. Yeah. We're going to review the recreation cost recovery policy. Yeah, this won't take very long. So I just, every couple of years, just want to cover cost recovery um, for recreation based on the uh, city council's policy that we are required to recover 80% of every dollar that we um, spend, excluding capital over $5,000. So uh, as an example of that, if we buy a treadmill at the at the rec center it costs four thousand nine hundred dollars we we have to cost recover that one if it costs five thousand and one dollar we don't have to cost recover <laughs> that's just a simple way to to explain that difference community events that are free are also excluded so our events like uh, rhythm on the river and long Knot lights uh, are not included into the cost recovery because they are generally, generally free to the public. Uh, sports field maintenance, several years ago, recreation um, started marking fields and, and there's really no way to directly recover all of that money, so that's not uh, included uh, in cost recovery. Uh, youth enrichment programs that are offered specifically for uh, at-risk kids, um, the one program that we do now is our uh, teen soccer program that is run through, uh, along with the, the middle schools, we have about 10 teams that participate in that. All other items are required to be recovered. All salaries, um, all costs of doing business, uh, utilities, uh, gas, that sort of thing are all in included in uh, the division's uh, cost recovery. Are the um, items that are excluded, is this a list that has developed organically? In other words, you're, make, you're, you're making your own guidelines, or is this... Uh, no, it's pretty required, pretty, required, pretty set by this, uh, the, the policy that was included in the, the, the packet. Council is the only ones that can do any type of exclusions or, or changes uh, to that policy. Adaptive events? Adaptive events are generally included in the cost recovery, 
but we internally within recreation have made a decision that we'll co recover about 50% and then cover, so cover the rest of it brother. for that, yeah. And that, that seems to work out really well. Uh, again, uh, those are the exclusions. Um, again, community events uh, and uh, the youth programs. Um, any specific questions you have so far? I was just wondering, uh, can you obtain grants from different people to account for that 80%? Or, and I guess my next <coughs> question is how hard is it to get the 80%? Since uh, we opened the rec center, it hasn't been very difficult at all. We have averaged uh, around 90 to 95 percent uh, each year. Um, I will put a caveat on the behalf of Bob Allen <laughs> that it's only including those things are, that are in the recreation budget. So one of the things that, that a lot of other places may not be able to do, but uh, um, facility maintenance and facility operations, for example. They do a lot of the maintenance at, at our facilities. We don't have to cost recover that because it's not in our budget. At some point in time, the city manager is going to move all those costs into recreation, not necessarily keep the cost recovery at 80%, but he really believes it's important to be able to demonstrate to the community what it really costs to run the rec center or Roosevelt activity pool, those, those sorts of things. So we have uh, a budget this year of just over $5.8 million. Our cost recovery uh, revenue amount is uh, just a little over $4.5 million. And if you uh, exclude those items that I talked about, field maintenance and and so on, it brings our cost recovery budgeted this year to about 84.2%. Okay. So it goes across all of the, the facilities, it's not facility it, by facility. Well, we, we can calculate it that way, but it's the bottom dollar that ultimately that uh, council is worried about. And then we <laughs> also do uh, a scholarship <coughs> program uh, that really is not included good or bad in cost recovery and, and I say that that way because there's really no dollars that cover the nearly ninety thousand dollars that are given away in scholarships each year we just absorb that in our operation of the ninety thousand that is given away on average about sixty eight thousand of that is actually used by those that uh, get the, the scholarships. And these scholarships are they, sports and stuff? They, so they can be, they're $100, up to $100, mm -hmm. anybody 18, under the age of 18, and they can be used for any program within okay. recreation except contracted programs. So if we contract a karate class, it wouldn't be used because it would actually cause recreation to have to write a check to that contractor. But uh, a lot of the, of the scholarships are used for um, summer passes to be able to use uh, the different facilities uh, when kids are out of school. And these are individual scholarships to, to individuals as opposed to programs? Correct, that, individuals. That can be subscribed to at no cost? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Any questions? So that 84% is of what is the target was? Uh, 80 is the target. Is the target. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, see, so, so this year about, about that target. Yeah, and in general, we'll we'll probably come in, you know, depending on what happens in our world and the impact that might have on on our facilities. Um, but I would guess that so far, January, February are are have been pretty good months. We're seventy five thousand plus ahead of last year. So I'd anticipate that we would be up uh, closer to 88 by years in. Again, that's projected, not, not knowing what's going to happen. Thank you. Anything else for Jeff on cost recovery? Open space acquisition. 
David? Yes, it's me. So this is a property that we have talked about in the past. Um, Dan's not here to see if he's the one who's brought it in the past, but um, this is what I like to know of is Clover Basin. It's out at Nelson Road in the 75th right here. See, this is West Range, is that right? Yes. Development. This, this, is right right there. Just north of the this is Boulder County's Lagerman Reservoir, and they have now this whole section right here that comes down here. Um, and then this is Clover Basin. And since 2014, Pratt has taken this to Boulder County and said, what are your priorities for property acquisition? This has been on that list since 2014. And then Dan brought it back in 2019. I'm going to give a little bit of background here because the county came to the city and said, hey, this property, which was known as the Johnson um, Land Trust, um, was sold. It now is back on the market to carve off some of the acres around the reservoir. And said, would you like us to proceed with this? And we said, that'd be great. The county was willing to take on um, the upfront cost of doing this. So they're doing the full acquisition that goes to Boulder County Commissioners tomorrow for them to approve this with the understanding that the city's goal would be to try to come to an IG agreement with them that um, we would participate in half that acquisition cost. Sequence is off because the county had a willing seller and something they knew we wanted to do, so they were taking that risk. But because council and Harold have really wanted like a 90 day lead time and getting new items in front of council, um, we'll be taking this to city council on May 19th. So um, just for this board, if you hear about it or see the paper, it's a, it's a property that has been out there from this body and from um, the open space program since 14, but again, um, the county is really taking the lead on this. The, the negotiations, they're coming with the money up front, and then the city um, will have some time to pay that back actually over time with the county as well. So we do or do not have a legal obligation to pay it back? At this point, we do not have anything written. It's the intent of, I think, the, the parties in good faith that this has been on our list, the city would like to participate in this, but until council approves that, we do not have any sort of formal obligation to, to do that. And what uh, what form do you see that taking, the it'd be, IGA? It'd be an IGA. And typically what happens is the county would do the acquisitions. They would then sell it back to the city, and they'd hold a conservation easement to kind of make sure that we maintain those open space values. That's also something that the city council is required that the city does anyway. So when we purchase an open space property, we have to go to a, another party and ask them to hold a conservation easement. So um, it'd be the, the same sort of situation, but instead of the city as a seller wanting someone to hold a conservation easement, it'd be the county selling it to us and they would maintain and hold that conservation easement um, to make sure that those open space values sit. I think between the city and county, they're pretty much in alignment to start looking at open space values, view sheds, wildlife habitat, non, um, you know, passive recreation, um, those things that we typically see uh, in county open space. And again, I think out here, we'd be looking at things if you think about Logman Reservoir with a um, pressure pond trail around it, we'd be probably looking at the same things up here at Druid. So that'd be one of the things that we, we definitely have had to talk to the county and to the county's constituents that, you know, what would this look like? And if the city goes through and council directs us to continue with this negotiation with the, the county and the IGA, um, we would do a public process. And that would be um, how we determine what's appropriate use out there. Also, natural resources staff would be involved in that. And it may turn out just like Lagerman has seasonal closures on this end because of Osprey. There may be significant wildlife habitat around here that we may not be able to open the whole property up. So those are things that are hard for us is to come out and tell neighbors and stuff what it'll look like because one, we haven't done that natural resource inventory and two, we haven't done a public process and that's the way long model really comes to those conclusions on what it would look like and is, is through that public process with natural resources staff weighing in on what that might look like. Can you kind just zoom in on that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, sure. Now, now you got to know where you're at. So the other thing is, sorry, you, you know, is that the, um, the city has about 95, 99% of the water in this. So we, we really do manage a lot of this. There's picnic and, and that company, the Clover Basin Reservoir Company, leases out the surface use at this point. Those are all things that could change if the city used to have ownership of the surrounding property. So basically the reservoir company owns this little road around it and then this portion up here. What the city and county are purchasing is basically this area around here to give us all this area. So there, there could be something, there's parking and stuff in here, but again, it's not a big parking lot. I think some of the neighbors are concerned that when I start thinking about other city facilities that look like Macintosh Lake, and would, it, would their backyard look like that? And 
you know, it's one thing that's hard to say what things look like in 20, 30 years, but if you think about kind of the porosity of a Macintosh Lake and people can come in from the backyards and side streets and neighborhoods, um, this does not have that same sort of environment around it. Really to get out there, you have to work a little bit more for it. You have to be able to go into hike in, jog in, or probably deal with some limited parking at a spot that is pretty much constrained by adjacent landowners. And I think, you know, as I say, it looks at the public process, we're always looking to get input from surrounding neighbors too to make sure we're fitting what's in, in the surrounding areas as well. And I think that more rural areas where this would be something we would try to keep that um, feeling rather than a more urban part. Sure. Yeah. The one thing I wanted to add is that we also have been petitioning Boulder County to have access to the AHI, um, sorry, comes down here, open space that they bought. We think there's a good potential. This is a 10 acre future neighborhood park site right here. Here's Dry Creek Community Park right here. The Dry Creek Greenway Trail essentially goes from the mall, Village of the Peaks, to 75th um, uninter uninterrupted at this point in time. We would like to make an underpass on a North 75th Street to connect into AHI, which is a five mile loop there. And then we've talked about, well, gee, if we get, come up here, do we do another box underneath uh, Nelson Road to connect that as well? So another great separated crossing. So those are things that we're thinking about as we're making, purchasing this land and trying to make uh, longer pedestrian connections for people to use for recreation. David, can you tell us, well, I don't know what a new community is. Non-urban, non-urban plan. What does that mean? Nelson Road is one of my shortcuts to Boulder traffic, relatively traffic-free Boulder, and I drive past it often. And sometimes you see motorboats pulling skiers and what is that? This. Facility here. It has floats on it. Uh, so uh, this, this is the answer to Paige's question yeah. first, and then we'll get to Rob's question. No, Thank okay. you. So I don't know if this is plan to describe it better, but a planned urban development is something you typically see in a more urban environment where you have, you know, accessible shopping, those sort of things that come with more of that urban feeling, so people have access to that. In a um, non-urban environment, it typically is trying to keep, keep that urban feeling to allow for a lot development and stuff. And are you seeing something that well, I'm trying to answer the question? What does is this going to be developed? So, I just don't know what that is. Clover Basin Ranch. That is, that's, that's already a private property that exists. I'm not sure what they are going to do with their private property. Um, I could I find out from the county, but I, I really don't know what they're It's the same color as county conservation easement. So, that is probably using. <laughs> so, sometimes with conservation easements, they allow for that the development of X number of houses on that, so that the conservation easement on that, so you have to put all your density in one portion of that and leave the rest undeveloped. So I'm speaking a little bit out of school, this is the county's process, but they will do that so that people can potentially get an additional unit on it, but it's because it's clustered in an area that preserves the, the larger integrity of the property. Um, and if you're looking at that map right here, right now we still, as of the day before, it's going to, um, the um, county commissioners, they, the sellers live right here, and they're concerned about a trail right along the property. So they've asked if, when the county sells this to the city, that if they could have the ability to have the county maintain a conservation easement over this, and it would not allow the public up on this little strip right here. That still allows for opportunities around the whole property, but it gives them a little bit of a buffer. So we're still having that conversation as of today. And Rob was asking about current recreational use of clover. Well, I was just yes. thinking that it's a, it's a, a I see a lot of birds right. landing in there. It's a, a stop on the migration road. And uh, I, I see motorboats and water skiing is inconsistent. What's the plan? What's the county's vision of what's going to go there? So, again, that's the piece where, first of all, again, this will continue to be owned by the reservoir company until at some point the city has full ownership, and I'm sure that will then be something that we would look at doing. But right now, the reservoir itself is owned by the reservoir company. So they're the ones that um, lease that recreational um, component of it. If and when the city had that, um, we would be able to have those conversations at that point on 
what what is consistent with the use out there. And I think as natural resource Baptist, I mean, this is one biased lens to look through, um, is really recognize it as a um, great sample of the migratory birds. And having been out there along here, there's some picking tables and stuff right here. Just looking across this to the west, that western view out to Longs and Meeker, um, across that with the, the waterfall on it is, I think, be a great opportunity. I just thought it was closed. It is closed okay. it, it, because the, um, the um, reservoir company still those too. Yeah. I could just get closer. And that's what we would, we right. really, when we put this in, that's what <laughs> things I think the crab and um, natural resources and open space programs said, this would be a great opportunity. We have, again, I don't want to step out there, like I would say, there's no, to be a public process. One of the things that natural resource really talks about is really just having an opportunity to put a bird blind somewhere or a couple out here where people just can go out and have this a little less intensive use on this property and try to highlight some of the the view sheds and the wildlife on this property. So um, soft surface trails may be some bird blinds, but again, that's just David talking from here saying throw out there that could go into the public process. We'll turn over to the professional to do it. <laughs> So that company on the who on the water rights? So the majority of those water rights are owned by the city at this point. So I can imagine at some point that we would have the ability to bring those in. And then it really would give us a lot more opportunity to um, deal with the recreation on the water as well as those picking tables and everything else is out there. So I think we can manage it much more holistically um, once the city has purchased it from the county and um, taken over all the rights. I think it's a Say it's about 95, 98 percent. The city has the rights in that reservoir at this point. Um, I know we, we haven't really talked about it too much in this group, but wearing those two hats for city employees, and when we say we have 90, even nine percent, um, there's still a fiduciary responsibility to that water and that company. So the city sometimes has to act in the best, best interest of the reservoir company and the ditch company, um, while still. Um, recognize they're they are city employees, but they still have they, they wear those two hats, and they're and when they're voting for something that let's say by having that lease to a ski club reduces the fees and assessments on the reservoir company, reduces the cost to the city to maintain it. They wear they have to wear that hat when they're when they're voting sometimes. So um, once it really switches over all to the city, then we can take a look at it. It makes it challenging to be in a meeting with them. When you're thinking, which hat are you wearing right now as you're speaking? Because they go back and forth really well. Yeah. But it's hard as not a person who's in that purview to to understand where they're talk, coming from. And, and if you think if you're the house that had those shares on that on that company and you've been paying historically a pretty low fee for your water, and the city decided that you know it's um, the city's best interest not to have that lease anymore, but then all the other shareholders ended up having to pay more because that lease went away. Um, that's the piece where they're they're still trying to wear that that and the city shares mm -hmm. piece of up as well. So. It's that piece they've been looking at all the time is how they represent the ditch and reservoir company while still um, and do the best they can as a city employee. So do you need any action from this I don't board think on we this do. right now? I don't think we do. I think it's been the fact that it's been to this board, board before, yeah. before. They put it on the agenda in 14. It's been part of the CIP process. And then Dan did an update. It looks like it was um, Actually, just December of last year is when he brought the whole list of all these properties and asked for this board's direction if you want to move forward with that. So, at this point, it's informational. I guess I think it's information. Thank you. Just um, say, yes. Here, Steve. Can you go to the endowment? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Oh, yeah, you're I'm master. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, who, who owns the land near the uh, Lagerman Reservoir? That's Boulder County. Where so, Boulder County actually now owns this is what they consider the HI property, but it's basically. Yep. They own it here, here on the board. Yeah, yeah. They own this pretty much this whole section. Then down here is the Lagerman and Reservoir Complex. Yeah. So I, I took a, a walk, a five mile walk, because there's a good trail there. Mm -hmm. Nice looking loop. Yeah, it's, it's a very nice loop. I think it's, when you get down there, this is a really unique place because it drops down in topography, mm -hmm. so you kind of lose everything around you. It's just amazing views off to the west, and you don't see the housing, you don't see the roads, you don't hear much. So it's, it's a pretty unique spot, and I think this will tie in very nice to that up there. And I, I guess maybe the one thing that, because I had it on the agenda, I guess if this group is, we're going to Boulder County um, tomorrow, and then we have um, council coming up that this group would want to take a vote and say they're supportive of us moving forward with this acquisition. That would be beneficial. Oh, so Jeff, do you have did any? We, did no, we do that in December? What did we do yeah. in December? What's that? What did we do in December? 
Sounds like it was kind of a big group. Yeah, I think that has a, as part of a bigger group. Here's all the things were going on. Are you good with that? And to be this individual property then. This council will perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I'm willing to entertain a motion uh, recommending to council that the city proceed with um, cooperating with the county on this uh, this purchase and a potential future IGA. Does anyone want to make that motion? Thank you. You got that? Okay. Let's, let's we'll review it. Um, uh, Prab recommends to city council um, that the city proceed with uh, a, a cooperative, David help me here, a cooperative agreement with Boulder County. Yes. Uh, for the uh, McLaughlin Open Space Acquisition. For the McLaughlin Land yeah. Acquisition. I was going to say I can't pronounce it, but I can read it off to you. <laughs> so Prab recommends to City Council that the city proceeds with a cooperative agreement for the McLaughlin Land Acquisition with yeah. Boulder County. Yeah. And do you want the spelling is actually? So this is a typo. It should be a G. A C. A C. A C. C. Yes. Oh God. N-C-L-A-C-H-L-A-N. Exactly. Okay. Okay, the motion has been made and seconded. All in, uh, any discussion? All in favor? All opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank Great, you. thank you. Thank you. Okay. Field trip. Okay, so the background here is that uh, on this board, we generally, uh, at some point in the summer, uh, have a field trip to some place that is not this room. Um, sometimes this is in, uh, in conjunction with another advisory board or another group of some sort. Um, and so we are here in March and we have not yet planned a field trip for this summer. Um, and so examples of previous field trips have been going up to Ralph Price Reservoir. Um, going out to Union Reservoir. Union Reservoir. Sandstone Ranch. Yeah. Um, so this is an opportunity. Unfortunately, we, while we have a quorum, we do not have full attendance for uh, members of the board. If there's some part of the city's parks and rec operation, open space, natural resources that you're particularly interested in, don't know very much about, this would be a good time to say, can we go? Well, we talked about going to the new that's what's been the new Dickens. 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 Yeah. 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 The, the, new place. the new place. The new place. Like, I don't know. Like, you know, going along the trail along yeah. the river. Too? I'm 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 very interested in this. I was yeah. here for three hours today, so I can do it at any point. <laughs> and tomorrow. Okay. We've done we've done internal tours to help get staff up to speed and everyone's been out there, so it's been really impressed with that thing. I just really yeah. appreciate it. Yeah, I would love to do that. I would love to do that too. Rob? Yeah, I also would like to like yeah. Macintosh, yeah. like, but Macintosh. <laughs> yeah, we have Macintosh, and I think I'd like to visit a golf course. I don't play golf. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've never we're been. We're not a golf course. We're, we're not a golf yeah. course. There's, there's, there's a separate golf course. course. Yeah, yeah. There's, huh? there's a separate board for the golf courses. Is that right? We are not the golf yeah. board. Yeah. Even though with recreation, yes. he's involved he's in got two, He's got two boards. I'll be fine. We used to be the golf board, but they have their own board now. So if you want to go golfing, just go. Jeff will give you a pass. <laughs> Scholarship. I, I don't even have a set of clubs. <laughs> well, then let's, uh, let's, let's, you know, rough in that we want to go to the Dickens Farm area. Um, yeah, Dickens and, Farm would be Because I, I think everybody's excited about all the new uh -huh. developments. All I would add is that there is going to be some sort of grand opening for Dickens and to not only Dickens but to celebrate the Resident Saint Frank project and council's plan for development of the land north of Boston Avenue and it could be a cultural event. You know, there's lots of things that are floating around out there that uh, staff I met with them last week, but they're looking at something in in late May to do some sort of a celebration out there on like a Monday afternoon or a Wednesday afternoon or something like that. So I'm happy to give tours at that point. Also, yeah, if, if you wanted to go somewhere else, yeah. if you were able to attend it, you will be invited to that. I don't know a date yet. 
but um, I, I, I color. Have our own I still like the idea. Of, yeah, <laughs> so they, so no, it's something geared towards this board, That's so fine. that we so we can ask lots I'm of questions. Yeah, sure. I'm happy okay. to. Have so, to are we looking at July? Whenever, if you could give us some um, proposed dates, we can check to see about getting. Could, are you going to invite council again? Absolutely. Yeah. So <laughs> get on the council agenda and see when that will work. All right. So let's uh, let's look at July. Um, would this would be in lieu of the July meeting? Mm -hmm. Typically, in this case. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, July thirteenth is when the meeting is scheduled. Everybody synchronize your calendars. Tell me what works and doesn't work. We'll ask this question again next month when maybe some more of our members will be here. I will start with I'm open. You know, the 13th or if some other day is better for. Steve? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, July 13th. I anticipate I'll be here. Okay. Okay. So let's tentatively plan that for July 13th. Invite okay. council. Yeah, yeah. Mac and Jeff and cover Steve Nelson, but he's so he involved, but he does a great job. Crab tour. Anything else on that? Ongoing items. Everybody take a peruse through ongoing <coughs> items. Questions, comments, concerns? I'm excited about the Macintosh like interpretive song. No, yes, they Danielle's done a really nice job with that. I think it's gonna be ever aware of that or has been a little bit of an update on it or am I want anything additional? I'm also excited about Danielle potentially getting a volunteer coordinator. Yes, as are we all. So. <laughs> <laughs> I had a couple questions. Um, one, I saw that Olander property sounds like we're, they're not going to work with us anymore. No. I just wondered what. So I, I think one of the, the challenges is one. We just got, we've gotten so fortunate. We've had a yeah. lot of willing, it's always willing buyers, willing, willing sellers. Um, that we've been able to make some good deals happen. Old Landers have been out there for a, a while. We've been talking to them, but it's never lined up. And I think when they finally lined up, and we had committed some other resources to other projects, we were in the process of trying negotiating different term agreements, and I think they were needing to try to cash out. And unfortunately, they didn't come to us with that mm. offer, and they, they went and found something else. I've, I've reached out to the Olander family and said, if something doesn't work, would you still be willing to work with the city? And they that's it, yes, they would be they consider that at this point. Um sound like they found some that can meet their price or terms. Do you anticipate do you anticipate will happen with that property? You know, it's it's hard to say. Um they have told us right now that it is a um farmer out of the Greeley area. So that could be for the next six months, next six years, but um we really don't know. Um, and my other question, I see Jim Crick's name on here and his charge to lead the team on the natural stream corridors. I'd love to hear a report from him sometime, that'd be, just I'm, what he's doing. Yep, that'd be sure. right. <laughs> <laughs> so it, he's, it's a collaborative effort between him and engineering and operations who does the maintenance of the creeks and our floodplain engineers. Um, to really do something that I think is unique, the fact that um, we have a very managed, I'm going to say fairly, but we have a very managed creek that comes to the town. It really is a water delivery system. If you really start looking at all the, the rights and who owns the water, and it really has for the last 100 years been a water delivery system. But trying to manage in a way that allows for the natural areas to exist and coexist with that, make sure we deal with our floodplain to keep people safe during flood events, make sure that as we allow things to grow back to be natural, that um, it doesn't impact that floodway so we can get in and clean it up and clear it out. It's managed fishery, so it's a very, very multi-pronged balancing of act that Jim is kind of working with, but I, I think it's really good. I was actually went out with Jim and Danielle this morning walking along St. Vrain, um, this was east of Martin Street, and I heard Jim say to somebody that 
Oh no, this is because they were asking why we would have to pull out all the the, sat, or the um, volunteer cottonwoods and willows. And Jim's like, oh, it's an engineered channel. I was like, that's the first time I've ever heard him say that. But it's yeah. true. It's not necessarily a creek anymore. It's an engineered channel that acts as a creek as it moves through the city. And what so fun. things with it's, the, he's been working with the storm drainage engineers and operations folks so much that he understands that now that we're trying to make it as native and as appropriate as we possibly can with other goals in mind. Especially once we took the FEMA dollars and they said that you have to engineer this in a way that passes a hundred year flood through your, your town. So that's kind of, since I've been here, I think you're on those groups, it really has been, how do we take an engineer structure, put it in a way that tries to achieve as much natural capacity as possible, and then overlay it with as much natural environment as possible, knowing that underlying structure really has to function as that um, carrying capacity for the water delivery plus flood conveyance as well. Um, and talking about pulling those little wheels, the engineering that's in the point that's like a bathtub that it holds X amount, you put a bowling ball in it, it starts to overflow. So if we we designed the tree, we came down almost every tree and willow oh, yeah. on that creek. We designed that there can be a tree here and a willow here. If we get another tree, that creek no longer holds that capacity. Um, so we have to get a management program that allows us not to let it get back to a point where um, it doesn't carry the capacity it was designed for. So it's going to be an ongoing maintenance piece where we have to. We've talked to Danielle, and she doesn't find anybody interested in pulling native plants from. Yeah. Riparian area, so it's not a very hot, uh, hot right. vo uh, volunteer project. And FEMA could come back at any time and say you're not meeting, you know, the requirements of the money you're given, and they start they can start you know, clawing money back if you're not meeting requirements. So I know if uh, Dan were here, he would point out that in two weeks is the Chick Clark fishing. Yes, thank you. Very much. So Lori is running it for this yep. year. Lori and uh, Scott Sievers. Dan's recovering from surgery. Oh, okay. So he'll be out for another four or five weeks. Um, all your kids 15 and under, send them over to <laughs> Yeah, they always have a great time. Fish. Okay, anything else in ongoing items? Uh, I see restrooms are opening soon. Yes. Okay, anything in uh, the mm -hmm. recreation ongoing items stuff? Pages 16, 17, 18. No wonder Rob's confused. It says golf fitness right here. <laughs> well, we're doing things for golf. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, items from staff. Steve. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm going to pass these around. Can you use some. I might have enough. Maybe in the pass over. You guys can do these if you like. Mm -hmm. Um, so you may have seen in the news recently that uh, Longmont has adopted a new brand and logo, and they are looking to um, incorporate that into signage and you know everything. Our website has been has been transformed, and our business cards and mailers and utility bill and all that sort of stuff are in the process of being changed to accommodate the new brand that. Uh, City manager's office. Um, I don't know that I don't think it went to council the brand. I think it was just an informed sort of thing. But you know, they have a new logo. It was in the paper the other day. Uh, this is something that's been in, engaged Longmont. Um, the survey ends today. I don't know if that's today, this morning, or, or today, midnight. And this is the survey. This is the survey. So we printed it out for you. Um, but they only really, really only asked you if you like. Option A or Option B. There wasn't any chance for comments or anything like that. The idea behind this is that it's going to be, you know, grand entry signs to let people know when you're entering Longmont, whether it's coming south on 287 from Berthoud, coming west on 119 from the highway, coming through the diagonal from Boulder, um, and I'm not sure how they're going to address coming from the west. But uh, looking at some big entry signs, and then there's, uh, there's just a generally assigned package um, for vehicle navigation and then the thought is to have some of this downtown um, this project was funded with in partnership with the uh, downtown downtown development authority visit Lamont, and the city paid some too so as part of this 
uh, consultant's task is to come up with wayfinding signs that integrate this new brand into the city's greenway and park system. And so you could be seeing um, on page, let's see, well, what, where public library is on your, on your, that could say Sandstone Ranch. That could say Clark Park. That could, you know, so that's something that we're working with um, the team. Uh, the, the project began last year in March and there was some public outreach in last summer, but Kat, neither Kathy nor I were involved in it, so we don't know exactly what that looked like. Uh, apparently, they had there was an event at Roosevelt that they where they had a tent asking people what they thought about the new logo and brand and something at the farmers market. Um, there, we're working on final design and an implement, implementation plan, and the design is supposed to be done at the end of April. Um, we there's. To consult well the city brand was done by a firm out of Cleveland and the woman who is uh, doing the actual design of the signs that you see here is out of Pittsburgh but she lived in Colorado for 20 plus years and moved back there to take care of an alien parent and so she's Colorado in heart so she knows you know about the area which is good but it does include you know gateway signs wayfinding signs for vehicles pedestrian wayfinding signs Street signs, if you go over to the Village at the Peaks, you'll notice that the new logo is on some of the street signs over that area. Um, parking signs, destination signs, being park entries and city facilities, and then wayfinding, regulation, and kiosks, and things like that in Greenway, or along Greenways and parks. Um, DDA has half a million dollars ready to start building these things. They're gonna be building one. There's a median just out, um, in Main Street adjacent to it's not South Main Station, what's it called? The the old butterball development that's now condos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's 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 not first in name, but I'll call it that just for lack of a better term. South Main Station. South Main Station, that's what it is. I was gonna say I thought it was South it Main Station. <laughs> I call I call it first in Main, the transit center. I get that mixed up with the RTD facility that's coming. Uh, but South Main Station, so they're gonna be putting a median in, in two eighty seven there with a sign such as this. And going to be looking at trying to in, uh, install some way find, new wayfinding signs around downtown. Kathy and I are trying to figure out how this will be distributed throughout the city over a period of time. Um, we currently don't have any budget or staff time allocated toward this, except what we're trying to scrape out to go to meetings that we're doing these days. Um, if we were to change every sign within the park system, the cost would be pretty high, very high. Um, and so we're trying to figure out whether we spread that over a number of years or if we just implement it as a sign deteriorates. And if that's the case, it could be 50 years before we have a whole new sign package. And so I uh, wanted to really update the board um, as far as what's being worked on. Uh, we have a sign package that we developed back in 2014, 15, 16. It was adopted in 2017 or 18? Right. 17, I think. Um, that we've been working on, uh, we've been using. And it's not only Kathy and, and, and me, it's uh, engineer folks like the, the woman who's building the Spring Gulch 2 trail. She'll be using signs like that. Developers, when they have to install signage, they have to meet our standards. So it's a pretty big group of people that would have to change. This person is going to be coming up with something that's, I, it sounds to us like it's gonna be a graphic representation of what the sign should look like, but not a true sign design, which we'll have to then hire somebody to go in and do. Um, and so would that be, I mean, that wouldn't just be parks, recs, open space signage, it would be everything. cities, so does DDA have money for this or, or no. is it Longmont? No, well Longmont would have to budget. We're talking I was I met out in Dickens with the, money our race for the their area, yes. yes. But for the city, like we're talking changing the badges on police officers' uniforms, changing the decals in every city vehicle. Um, it'll be a intense endeavor. And so if we are tasked with doing this, there'll be a monetary challenge we're not sure how we're going to fund that 
will also be a staffing challenge because this is something that would take a lot of time and effort. And so it may end up pushing some other projects that we have been talking about with you down the road um, based on what we're hearing from the city manager's office. Is that so yeah, I think we have been tasked with this. <laughs> um, and it's something that, you know, again, as far as funding and stuff, that's where city management council will work with us on how we prioritize things. But I think one of the, the biggest pieces for us is the logistics of how we do this in a systematic way. So that again, like Steve said, if, if we have funds and we just start replacing signs over time, so there's a sign at the back part of Golden Ponds that's new, and there's a sign over at Dawson that's new, but or do we just go ahead and try to tackle the entrance signs of a lot of parts at first, so people get this this um, feeling of this is now the, the branding is happening. So I think that's the real conversation we're having right now is how do we logistically implement this in a way that takes our our resources and times and tries to get the biggest bang for the buck on that. A very rough estimate would be two and a half to three million dollars to just do for the parks, parks, parks and greenways. One of the things that we've also, Steve and Kathy have been very good about working with the consultant on, is that even though we want to have the branding that represents the city's identity, that I think we've worked very hard over the years to try to make sure we're on the same brain greenway, you know you're on that versus left hand greenway. And the consultant has kind of used the language of dragging some of that through, so you still have a little bit of feeling that you're not just on a greenway in Monmont, but you're on the St. Brain Greenway versus left-hand green, greenway versus somewhere else Sandstone Ranch. So I think they are listening to us as far as how we implement it, implement it in a way that kind of keeps the identity of some of those underlying um, areas that I think are very special to the community. We're hoping that's the case. I don't well, think we're there. Well, I don't think we're there, right? I did, you know, the language I say she used is kind of dragging those underlying pieces yeah. through. I also assume that um, going through. there's a certain portion of this problem where is there is a perfectly good sign there and you want to change how it looks, you know, and, and you're using the word branding, using the new branding, but I assume there are also signs that need to go up that, that don't exist. Correct. There are so, signs going up at Dickens tomorrow. They have nothing to do with this because there's not a plan yet. But once there is a plan, you know, there's a, there's a, presumably a gap to be filled, signage-wise. And, yes. And, yes. And so this yes. is not merely a, they were all green before, now they're going to be blue, exercise. Not necessarily. There are I'm signs. Sure part that, of it is. But. So, so we had, when we finished our sign package in 2017, the goal was to get an intern to go out and inventory all of our signs. We have not yet been able to accomplish that, but we really need to know. We have an inventory in our Hanson program, which Timber has described to you guys beforehand, beforehand which is really our asset management program. It just says sign. We don't know what that sign says, if that sign is necessary, if that sign, what condition that sign is. We just have sign. And that's what we have not yet captured is going to each park and along the greenway systems and saying, okay, we have 40 signs in this park. We could probably get by with 30. They need to be here. They need to be this size and have this message. And uh, that's something we have not yet tackled. So my question is, part of this is work that you are intending to do and that will need to be done whether there's a new brand or not. This, this is definitely, it's a challenge. So we're yeah. really direct because, um, because this is a direction to go that way, but still in the concept phase. And we, mm -hmm. we have that gap. There are signs to be put in because of Steve's doing new parks, staff, Kathy's doing renewals. Right. Um, so it's kind of that, well, just hold off on the signs and maybe we do temporary. Well, we don't have a standard for temporary, so right. maybe we just minimize what we're putting in so we can hit those basics and we'll call our existing signs temporary until we get to that point but um yeah there's, there's a gap i, I can see where it's an uncomfortable logistical and planning yes and and, and and to your to your point that yes that was a project that we would have to do anyway but if you remember in february we brought to the board the 42 projects that we're not yet working on yeah, yeah, yeah. that wasn't one of them mm -hmm. Right. So it's not, so it's not even that it's not even that far along <laughs> in terms of planning. Well, no, it, it's going to jump up yeah. above the 40 right. because whatever and push those issue. down. Let any of the decisions on that come to this board or we just start informed? Is your this informed is at this point in time. But you're welcome to make comments otherwise, but yes, you're very informed at this point. Thank you, Steve. David. Um, 
Great. I just, I just oh, I'll go back to you as well. Actually, the Dickens event, I just wanted to mention that, and I've already mentioned it. That was the other thing. I'll let Steve fill in some gaps here, but this update for, for this board on. Um, I talked about um, Clover Basin going on May 19th, as far as going to take it, that to council. We're going to have a, it's an information, it's an information um, night, so we'll always be giving a Study session. Study session. There you go. It's a study session. So we really want to talk about you know some of these things before they get in front of them. So we're talking about Clover Basin. Steve has Workman Park and South Clover Basin, which is not quite the same as Clover Basin, but um, two parks that have some challenges with naming, um, some funding issues, some timing issues. So we want to get that out in front of them so they can kind of understand what they'll be seeing when we get there. So let Steve talk about those two. And then the other piece of legal has asked us to take to council is that our current code language says that in the disposition of open space, um, we have to have these criteria that I think the city has been very good about meeting in the past. That it has to um, be to achieve a goal that has a higher value to the city. If you sell this property, you'd be buying something at a, of a higher value. Well, as they looked at that, they started looking at our conservation easement piece that we we're actually selling a piece of open space to someone else to hold that conservation real property interest in that property. And the code also says you can't sell an open space for less than the purchase price. So there's a conflict in saying, well, we have said we're selling the conservation easement for half the price of the property, but we're retaining the other half of the property. They still don't think that lines up with us selling a portion of the property at less than the full purchase price. So I see that what page we've had the, We've had the conversation with legal on this for a while. And um, I think open space entities have been done this for a long time. You recognize that private properties are made up of bundles of sticks and we're selling one of those bundles for the price that it's worth. Our code does not state that that clearly though. So I, I think what council is really ask, or our legal council is asking us to do is clean that up so it's clear to everyone. So I think rather than trying to have a debate over, I think what we're gonna to try to do is just clean it up so down the road in the future, um, people recognize that <coughs> Whatever portion of open space you're selling, the whole has to equal the acquisition price. So if you sell a conservation easement and you retain a portion of it, those two pieces have to add up to the whole. So those are the big pieces, Steve. Yeah, conservation easements are lost on some, and so it's, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's exactly. Questions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. Yes. Uh, if you recall, South Clover Basin Neighborhood Park is basically this area in here um, and I brought that back to the board that one's pretty easy uh, you guys recommended Clover Meadows Park to uh, council and I'm now just getting around to writing the council comments suggesting that to them there will have to be an amendment to the, the developer of this land right here gave us eight hundred thousand dollars to move that park up in the development park development process um, $650,000 for construct, design and construction and then $150,000 for maintenance. The problem is when that agreement was made back in 2013-14, they, they just said $650,000. Well, in 2014, $650,000. In 2020, that's about $550,000. You know, depreciation has happened. There was no uh, escalator. And also it said that the city can contribute a maximum of $100,000, which we'll need to contribute more than that. So those are just some things that I'll be bringing to council for them to understand before they adopt the master plan. Uh, the other one is the workmen. If you remember right, that's right here. South, here's the, here's the museum and rec center. And um, that one, if you recall, the naming was just name it after, uh, we don't have any park names with Hispanic families and so we haven't felt comfortable um, going to council and just saying you know these were three Hispanic people that were recommended by the public what do you think so we are engaging with a hundred or so Latino leaders within the community via email uh, starting next week they'll have three weeks to suggest uh, people who are of Hispanic descent or Latino descent that meet the criteria with remember the criteria that were there and then we'll have a public meeting that 
basically invite people, the board will hear about it as well, who want to come and prioritize those. We'll take those those priorities to the council that um, to try to find a name for that park. This park also will need a little bit of extra money, well not a little bit, a lot of extra money uh, to build the irrigation pond that wasn't budgeted at the time of, uh, of putting the CIP together. So those are the sorts of things I'm going to be bringing to council in on May 19th. On May 26th, they'll see the resolutions with the proposed names, the supplemental appropriations, and the uh, agreement, uh, the uh, annexation agreement amendment to reflect what we talk about in the 19th. Uh, it was conveyed to me that it's a bigger conversation to council, and it, since it's complex, they wanted to, uh, to push that out and have that conversation with them. Yeah, Steve. That sounds great. I'm glad you guys are doing that. Good. Thanks. David, anything else? No, that is it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff? The only thing I had uh, comes from the clerk's office, and the clerk is recommending that all board members create a crab only email um, so that uh, all business that's regarding crab is done through that email. That way, if there's ever a public records, request that they're not going through your personal email it's all done through that uh, prep dedicated one and would ask that you consider doing that uh, I, I can't say that it's mandatory um, but would ask you to really consider that uh, here in the next week or two and then get that update to Aurora if you would I think we get a CI dot long one alias I don't know. I don't know the answer. Do you know the answer? I don't know. I will ask that. Yeah, do they do it for council? I have no idea what the process would be to do it for board members. Thank you, Jeff. Yep. That is from board. Minoj. Oh, I don't have anything. Thank you. Page. 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 <laughs> Why do I keep doing that? <laughs> Page. Uh, I started that last week. It was, it was like, a, it's like a thing. It just happened to me. <laughs> we had talked at the, uh, at the last meeting about potentially doing kind of a survey of meetings, if people are going to be able to attend, because I know there are yes. various, and I, I know I have work conflicts with, like, June and August. And I know, I think you said Dan and Sue. Dan and Sue were out in June, I think. Yeah, also. quite a bit. So I just think it would be good to send the dates around and have everyone say, they know their availability. Do you have fun? Well, but just to collect it for. Yeah, we'll do that. Because I think we may, there may be some that we want to change because we may not have a quorum. Absolutely uh, open to uh, schedule changes if necessary. Um, the most important thing is to have a quorum, which is four of the seven uh, members. Obviously, we prefer to have a full uh, full attendance. Um, so good. That's it. Thank you. Rob. No, I'm not. No, I'm not. <laughs> yes, Steve. I forgot something. Oh. <laughs> um, you would ask me about apprised of the CIP schedule as it revolves. Uh, Dale has to have all the draft CIPs to city manager's office May 1st. So that's a rough no. internal deadline. April 3rd. No, no, no. May 1st. For CIPs? Yes. No, it's April 3rd. No. The system closes April 3rd. No. No. All right. <laughs> That's why I said uh, that. My was, computer died already pulled up in the email. That was the email we just got from Sandra. Yeah, no. It's no, it said it needs to go there. So our deadlines are going to be first or second week Yours of April. Is tomorrow, then, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I am not going to have everything ready by April 3rd, I'll tell you that. So right. I could have swore that's what it said. But if there are any thoughts from the, the board now or via emails to Jeff and David, would be a. Uh, by tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's part of why I was wondering about the, you know, if there's a significant delay in some of the projects we talked about because of the wayfinding and signage. Mm -hmm. It would be helpful to know, like, what might get delayed if we. We don't necessarily know that yet. Yeah. Um, it'll be a Dale and Harold decision. We would propose things to them. Sandra, S A N D R A. All right. Doing budget second. Um, at this point, uh, if the public would like to be heard. I took notes on a couple things. <clears throat> First, 
Affalter Park upgrades, Kathy Crone. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about that if possible, um, just because we have consistently rented that park for a handful of years and are pretty dependent on it. And if there's changes afoot, See, we'd like to know. Sure. Um, the, the, the crux of that project, the crux of that project is, no, where am I? What's that? That's a major. Yeah, no joke. April third's right. ridiculous. So yeah, no May first. At Fulcher Park. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, wrong way. Where am I? You're right. Just the east and the north. Thank you. No. All right. I need to find. Sure. <laughs> David, do you hit R for me, please? Yeah. There's sunsets. So you can come across. It's yeah, just to your right across and then down. Down. Right there. Right there. Right there. Sunset, okay. Sunset, so. Yes, that's sunset, so it's further down. No, 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 no. It's on the other just side. Just around the other side of the football field. Yeah. yeah. Where the track is. There. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. The main part of that project is the demolition of the restroom slash pump station building and rebuilding a, a new ADA conforming modern day uh, restroom and pump house. There will be some work on the uh, ball fields right here uh, along the uh, edge of the infield. They'll be working on this bed right here and the entry sign. Some minor irrigation modifications. The playground was redone three years ago or so. Um, but beyond that, there's not really uh, much. That's pretty much what's involved in that. Questions? So the, the grass area is not going to be impacted, and if it's being re rehabbed as a better baseball facility, is that being prescribed to be baseball specific? No, use? still planning for St. Frank soccer use, and I know that it's in her plan to accommodate game uses. We'll be bringing in two sandlets for the season, the spring season anyway, to the bathrooms will be out of order, so there'll be restrooms there for people to use. And then, oh, thank you for that. The only other question I had, and this is not necessarily driven by conversations I've heard here, but other through city council members, growing direction of a lot of, you know, 113,000 people are going to be in Longmont and more higher density. And every time I hear, we keep on talking about the use of parks and not being able to get new parks on the ballot or done, right, because of the scope of the work. Um, do developers have to have a certain amount of open space or park if they put it in an apartment complex or townhomes? Because more people, same amount of old parks, those are figure that they're going to be overused. More people with fewer backyards also. Exactly. Right. With the new code update, which just happened last year, uh, they did away with what was called common open space requirements. But there are landscaping requirements for developments depending on what it is. So if you're asking whether an apartment complex needs to have X number of acres around it as far as green space, that's not the case. The, the, new, the new code is... Like to the funds well, there, there is the park fee, the park development fee for every certificate of occupancy for a building. So if you're building apartments, it's for each apartment. If you're building houses for each house that developers pay that go into our park development fund, which pays for new parks. The funds that Kathy uses for park renovation comes from a different source, and that's from a $2 fee, mostly from a $2 fee from the community, which raises about a million dollars a year or so. But there's not an explicit per hundred, you know, per thousand people X Right. I'm going to go up to a new part of town of that I know parks. pretty well. So, like, this area. This is, let's see, here's Stephen Day Park. So this is Wolf Creek, if I remember right, something like that. This is a pocket park that, for the development to have, but it's private property. We don't own it. We don't manage it. There is likely there is likely a public access easement over it. So if you were butt riding your bike through here and got stopped, you probably have a right to be there. But you, we would never program that for any sort of event or anything like that. So it's, it's not, it's a, not a city park. It's not a city park, correct. Same goes for this area here and this area here. So those that was the old development where they were, were required to set aside a certain amount of acreage 
for common open space areas for residential development. That has shifted, I guess, within the planning community, and so the new code changed that, just like there's no parking requirements for developments anymore. Um, and I don't, unfortunately, I don't know much more of the details of that, because I only look at public property. I don't really yeah. follow private property as much. I don't know if there's ever going to be a recommendation, but that seems like something that is very nearsighted. But, but what we are hearing is that there there is a there is an yes. inflow into the public purse for new parks. Yes. Based new on parks, certificates yes. of occupancy, but not necessarily a requirement that a particular amount of new park be built. Right. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Anything else, Sam? No. Thank you. Well, in that case, I think we're done. I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I move we adjourn. Thank you. Is there a second? Yes. All in favor? Motion passes unanimously. This I'll meeting is adjourned. Out. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, if you ever wanted to hear a. Uh,